So the first lecture is actually starts on page um, <clears throat> page three of your manual. It's called the Three Rivers, and this is a. It's really one of the the, the lectures I do um, at the start of any training or any. If I do on a weekend workshop, at least I'll do this this um, this Three Rivers lectures here. So let's look at these Three Rivers, and I'll do it the way I do it, and then we'll look at some of the ways that it's in the book here as well. Okay. So let me know, I did test this mic yesterday. I'm gathering you can still hear it okay even when I come away from the mic a bit. Is that still all right? Cool. And um, I'm a little notorious for really crappy writing, so I'll, d I'll do my best to slow down and write on the board well so you can understand it. But as far as my school goes and Pari Yoga goes, um, this is what we're studying, these seemingly three separate systems. You know, we see books on Ayurveda and then there's books on yoga and then there's books on Tantra or, you know. So we're going to study each of these seemingly separate systems. But what we're going to understand by the end of the week or even by the end of today is that these three systems are pretty much inseparable. And without each other, they're really an incomplete system. Because when we're looking at the mind-body-soul complex, or the mind-body-spirit, you know, we've, we've all heard that in New Agey sort of teachings, that's, that's what we are. We're a mind, we're a body, <laughs> with a mind, which is our instrument in which the soul experiences life. So we have this mind, it's, you know, I say here, but it's not here. We'll talk about that a bit more. Your mind is wherever you put it. Um, so we have a physical body. We all pretty much get that part. We all have a mind. We probably understand that. We all have a soul. Okay, and I know, you know, that's, that's a big topic. And we'll talk a little bit about this, that, this training. Not a ton. It's more other trainings. But that's our complete experience as a human. We're a physical body with the mind and then a soul that's looking through our body, experiencing life through our body. Okay, so if we're looking at a holistic system of health and healing, then we need to look at all three systems for complete health and healing. We can't just simply get the body in great shape and neglect the mind. It's gonna be incomplete, right? Because uh, I know a lot of people that are really attuned, fit, physically fit and ripped and not at all at peace. <laughs> you know, many, many of them. Um, so any one of these systems, it's hard to work. You, know, you might tap into soul and I'm just all into esoteric teachings and spirit and I've really connected to spirit. But if your body's, you know, um, if your body's diseased or suffering in any way, then it's really going to upset your experience of life. You know, there's going to be some suffering. So, so the ultimate goals really here is to, I'll speak for everyone to some degree, and if you don't agree, that's fine. You can let me know. But I think one of the ultimate goals that we're studying this stuff is to suffer less, right? There's some kind of suffering that's motivated us to get here, I would imagine. Or you want to better yourself in some way or form. If you want to better yourself in some way or form, there's a, some form of suffering that's gone down. You know, I'm not happy with where I'm at. Some aspect of my life or many aspects of my life aren't working for me. It's causing me some grief or some suffering or some pain. So I'm going to find out ways to overcome that. So that's sort of the ultimate goal is to overcome suffering, overcome fear. Really, I probably need to say any more than that. Overcome fear and suffering. <laughs> So in order to do that, we've got to look at all these three levels of the body, uh, uh, three levels of the being, all right? So that's what these systems are. And um, <clears throat> although I'm going to map them out separately like this, they all study each other. They all link together, and that's what we'll get to in the end. So if we're looking at the body, mind, soul sort of model, it kind of fits in here pretty good. We could look at Ayurveda as... Primarily, principally, setting up your body, your vessel, to be most fit to carry your soul. OK? 
okay? Ayurveda absolutely looks at the soul and it absolutely looks at the mind. But I'm just, for the sake of this model, we'll say that Ayurveda's, one of its main focuses is to prepare your vessel to be operating optimally. All the systems in your, in your vessel, our body, I'll keep calling it the vessel, but your body is your vehicle that the soul's experiencing life through. One of the main studies, one of the main focuses of Ayurveda is to optimize your experience in your body. Okay. Um, yoga, and when I talk about, I'll just go through them and then we'll go down and make some lines. Yoga, and um, even when I say yoga, it's just, you know, I imagine there's, there's many different um, Many different versions in people's minds. Even in here, I bet there's everyone's got slightly different version of what yoga is. When I talk about yoga in this training or any time, I'm talking about yoga. I'm talking about Patanjali yoga, a classical yoga. Okay. Classical yoga, which is Patanjali, Lord Patanjali. And the Yoga Sutras. talk about them in a little bit more. Um, Patanjali is the grandfather of yoga, is, what they, is, is how it's said. There's different styles and different schools of yoga, but if we're just talking about classical yoga, Lord Patanjali was who gave us the Yoga Sutras somewhere over 2,000 years ago, somewhere between that and 2,500 years ago. And most of this great textbook, which is 196 short aphorisms or short pithy statements, that um, mostly talk about the mind. They mostly talk about the mind, psychology, um, <clears throat> so understanding all different aspects of the mind, understanding the, the aspects of the mind that, um, and the operations of the mind that create suffering, and then how to use other parts of the mind to overcome that suffering. And then how we can link to soul. So it's all three. And it's, there is an aspect of physical body in even what Patanjali talks about. But primarily the main focus is the mind. Okay. And then Tantra. And again, like yoga, I mean, you say Tantra. I was just having a conversation with my neighbor yesterday. And it was really rewarding to say Tantra and have someone know that I wasn't just talking about weekend sex workshops. It was really great to know that that's out there. Tantra itself is really one of the most comprehensive schools of yoga, and it incorporates all of the teachings of everything. But for the sake of this model, I'm going to say it, that its main focus is energy or prana. Okay, and soul even. So it's more, it's, it's, it's about the masterful management of energy. Okay, so that's just the basic outline. Like I said before, all three, Tantra, does it work with the body? Yes, absolutely. But it works with it from an energetic standpoint. Does Ayurveda work with the soul? Absolutely, but it, it uses the body as a gateway, as a means to experience the soul. Yoga, mostly the mind, but do they use body? Absolutely. Different schools use it more than others. Tantra uses it, is a school of yoga that uses the body more than even this school. And does this school use energy? Absolutely, it does. But we're just, for the sake of this, we'll look at each one that gives an emphasis to each three of these sort of aspects of um, life. So Ayurveda itself, and I like to explain Ayurveda in, in uh, like this, basically. <laughs> Because um, again, it's another one of those things that's becoming popular and it's becoming well known again. And, um, and just like all the other systems, it gets pretty watered down. It gets relatively, you know, it's spa treatments and maybe oil on your head, shiradara, some herbal remedies and diet, you know, and that's sort of the big wrap it gets. But we'll look at Ayurveda in two ways. Okay, and the word itself. If you've read anything about Ayurveda, you, you, one of the first things you read is the word Ayur, or Ayur is means life um, or longevity. And then Veda, which word comes up a lot in the yoga tradition, 
Beta means um, knowledge or science, understanding. So the word itself means the, the, um, the science or system, systematic approach to life and longevity. So how to live a long, prosperous life. The study of, the study of nature itself. Okay. So Ayurveda is the study of life and its qualities. Now, this, the two ways I look at Ayurveda is this Ayurveda is in the principles, which is what we just talked about, the science of life itself. So that's a big science. If it's the science of life, then it's including everything. It's including how you sleep, how you eat, what your work is, what your enjoyments are, food, sleep, sex, all those, they're the three pillars of, of Ayurveda. Um, exercise, creativity, it's all in there. They look at the science behind all of those things. So there's Ayurveda and the principles of Ayurveda, which you can apply towards anything. So the principles of Ayurveda, which, we, which is what we'll go into today, is based up the five elements, basically. And then it breaks down into three doshas, which is these biological humors that sort of related to our systems functioning and how, what we're made up of. Um, and then, uh, and then they break down into five subcategories each, which we'll look at a little bit. We'll look at one of them more specifically, the Vata ones. Um, so the understanding is that each person is an individual and we're made up of these five elements and so is everything in the universe. It's all made up of five elements, which we'll go into. I'll just sort of give the overview now. But then they work at, look at the qualities of each of these five elements and they break down into 10 pairs of qualities. And then you apply the, the, the basic principles of like increases like and op opposites balance. This is just a very basic overview of Ayurveda. Then you can apply that to anything, whether it be cooking and herbs, whether it can be a yoga practice, whether it can be just what kind of work you do. It can be you can apply these principles to your relationship and communication based off the elements and the qualities. That's the, that's the base foundation of, of Ayurveda, is the elements and their qualities. So just think, so there's Ayurveda principles, which is what I just explained, but then there's Ayurvedic medicine. And what that is, is India's oldest, well, it's the, the planet's oldest medical system, uh, possibly one of the most comprehensive medical systems that covers all layers here, you know. So then what they do is just apply all these principles of Ayurveda and put it into a medical science. So I just want to separate Ayurvedic medicine from Ayurveda because why they are related, I don't want to get them mixed up. If I'm talking about Ayurvedic medicine, I'll, I'll say it like that. If I'm just talking about these principles of nature, then I'll call, that's what I'm talking about when I just say the word Ayurveda. Okay. So three of the main things in Ayurveda they focus on is one is purification. So removing the toxins out of the body that are already in there and then uh, living a lifestyle that allows you to live more clearly and not put more toxins or, or at least, you know, be able to eliminate the toxins that go into your body well. So one of the, so one of the main focuses of Ayurveda is about purification and, and there's many ways to do that. There's sort of daily techniques um, that are somewhat related to the Hatha Yoga tradition, like the, the Shat Karamas, which is sort of scraping your tongue, neti pot, um, you know, you can do Abhyanga, dry brushing, things like this. Uh, even oil pulling, it's not traditional Ayurveda, but they do uh, you know, acknowledge that as a, a great way to help purification. Um, Kaplabhati, breathing techniques is a form of um, purification. Even Trataka or a candle gazing meditation, single pointed meditation is a form of purification of the mind. So that's one of the, the you can do purification on a daily kind of level like that. Um, you know, and then there's then there's a more intensified purification process of, of Ayurveda, which is called pancha karma, which pancha means five and karma means action. Um, so there's five specific actions. And, um, you know, they're a little bit more in depth. They've got to do with purging, vomiting and, and enemas, things like that, even bloodletting through leeches, sucking out and purifying the blood. 
you know. It's more of a process you may go through once a year or once every few years. It's more extreme. If you've got more deeper toxins that need drawing out of your system, you could go to a Panchakarma hospital or retreat for, you know, from somewhere, anywhere from five to maybe 21, 30 days, depending on your constitution or your level of toxicity. And they run you through this rigorous program of really what they call sattvic foods or very sort of purified foods. You do meditation, very little stimulation. There's a lot of oiling in your body to bring the toxins out and sweating to sort of remove toxins and, and different herbal um, concoctions that's, that sort of act as, um, you know, el elimination forces in the body. So there's all these pretty heavy duty um, practices that they go through. So purification is one. That's just the point I'm making. Purification, and then the other one is strengthening. So it's kind of in the, even in that order, really. I mean, it, de it depends. It's very dependent on individuals. This is another thing, panchakarma. It's really, you know, it's meant to be a full-on science of what every individual needs. If you ever get an opportunity to do a panchakarma where you're doing the same one with a group of 10 or 20 people, I probably wouldn't do it, you know. <laughs> I would more get one that's geared specifically towards you and then it's going to be more conducive. But then the next thing is about rebuilding your system and your tissues and strengthening them. You know, strengthening your nervous system, strengthening the level, uh, uh, the quality of your tissues and so forth. So we can do that through, um, and there's lots of ways you can do that, strengthen your system. You know, there's, on a physical level, there's exercise. Then another way, another primary way of focus of Ayurveda is your, um, your digestion. I mean, if you want strong, uh, good tissues in your system, you've got to have a good assimilative system. You've got to have a great digestive system. Elimination helps with strengthening, actually. You know, then there's diet, herbs, or herbs, depending on what side of the world you come from, lifestyles. You know, there's a big list behind both of these. But um, so strengthening is strengthening on, on all levels, you know, even mentally. There's ways of strengthening your mind. There's ways of strengthening your body. There's ways of strengthening your energy, your nervous system. One of the big key words here is ojas. And uh, we will go into this a bit more. We'll, we'll talk about the subtle essences or the subtle doses a little bit later in the training. But this ojas is really your overall strength, and it's it's really one of it's one of the key focuses of Ayurveda, and I, and I think it, overall it's one of the key focuses because your ojas is your overall strength. It's your overall resilience, your resistance uh, against disease, your resistance against change, your um, resilience towards what's happening around you. You know, so it's on a quite a deep level. Ojas, so it's, it's your overall capacity to handle life and, um, and what it throws at you. So we will talk a little bit more about Ojas, but these are sort of two of the main things. And, and as a third one, so purification, strengthening, and, and that includes your digestive system, elimination, all your functions of your body. And third is really about balancing. I'll just write the word balance, but it's about maintaining balance um, and it's such a general statement you know it's like what is balance balance in Ayurveda is very specific to you individually you know what's a balanced eat a balanced diet you know if, if you're an Ayurveda that doesn't cover it you know to, to get told to go eat a balanced diet it's like what is a balanced diet it depends greatly on the individual what a balanced diet is. So this balance, we're talking about doshas. We want to keep your doshas in balance. But then we could say we want to keep your gunas in balance as well. We want to keep your pranavayus actively in balance. So the balance part is really about just keeping your system in its most optimal state. Then it's really, um, which is another key word of Ayurveda, then we're looking at preventative health. Okay, so then it's like maintaining a daily practice or a dainacharya is what they call it, or ma maintaining a lifestyle 
that's going to be conducive to keeping you as close to your constitutional state as possible, which is called your prakriti, which we're going to talk about that after I do the Sankhi model. So we're going to download a lot these first couple of days. So I'd suggest like take a lot of notes and because there's going to be a lot of information. So that's sort of the main focus of um, Ayurveda. I'm doing my model. I'm not even looking at the manual. Let's see. And, and they, Rod does it the other way. Rod says Ayurveda is the sister science of yoga. Yes, it absolutely is. It's a sister science of Tantra also. Um, this, the focus of yoga is on the interplay between energy and consciousness. The focus of Ayurveda is on the, in, the interplay between matter and the mind. Okay. Um, health is more than the absence of disease. Okay. So that's a good point. Svast, he's got svasti. You'll see it written as svasti or svasta. But svasta or svasti means, on one level, it means perfect health like health like you're thriving on all levels not just physical health but you're perfectly embodied in yourself who you're meant to be that's what spasta means on a physical level mental and creative energetic level as well um ayurveda creates balance so you can max maximize the effectiveness of your practice so that's another point ayurveda is sort of two main um, goals if you like is one is to just so you be healthy, you know, just so you can be healthy and enjoy being in a healthy body. But one of the more uppity levels of what Ayurveda is about is um, basically making your life longer so you've got more time to do spiritual practice, but optimizing your system so you can handle these powerful energetic practices of yoga and tantra. Because when you start getting into deep tantric hatha yoga practices of holding your breath for long periods of time and, you know, bandhas and doing long kumbhakas and doing all these big energetic movements in the spine and spinal kriyas, you want to have, you want to make sure your vessel is in, not a leaky vessel. You want your vessel to be strong tissued, strong ojas, a strong container to be able to hold the amount of energy it takes for your spiritual practice. Because spiritual practice is really about embodying fire, the energy of fire. I don't mean physical fire, but embodying the, the spirit and energy, you know. So in order to do that, um, you want your vessel to be in great shape. It's like sending a rocket to the moon, you know. You probably wouldn't just build it out of plywood, you would want to, it's probably titanium and making sure everything's sealed. It's the same thing. If you're on a journey, if you're going on a long journey to your soul, you want to be in good shape. So that's, you know, that's really the optimum goal of Ayurveda is to prepare you for the long journey of your spiritual practice in your life. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is there, is there questions popping up? I haven't even looked on here yet. Let's have a look. Brad, what page are you on? Oh, how long ago was that? Um, oh, that's sorry, page five. Page five is the Three Rivers um, Ayurvedic section. If you probably already, oh, already, you're already answering it. Okay, I'm, I'm way behind here. Never mind me. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to yoga. So I won't spend too much time on this stuff. It's pretty easy to get carried away with these uh, Three Rivers thing. Classical yoga, the mind. Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a huge part of psychology. Yoga is not just psychology. That's an aspect of it. Your mind is a tool and an instrument that consciousness moves through. So what we really want to do is make your mind as st the ultimate goal of, tr of traditional or classical yoga and Patanjali yoga is um, to, s to make your mind or the lens of your mind crystal clear and still without any movement at all or very little movement so that what moves through it is a clear and truthful expression of consciousness it just sounds so simple when you say it like that doesn't it <laughs> all the, the may the goal of yoga is just make your mind still and clear so consciousness moves through as the truth that's, that's yoga, you know, that's the second yoga sutra. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. That's, you know, one of the most famous of the sutras, but it's stating what yoga is. Um, 
And, and basically yoga is the f complete control over the te roaming tendencies of the mind. So, um, so this text is about how to do that. You know, it, it sounds so simple in, in, um, when, I, when you sort of state it, but that's what the goal is to make your mind still. So consciousness moves through as the truth. But there's so many things that move the mind and there's so many things that we get attached to. There's four aspects of the mind as explained in Vedanta. Uh, and I'll see, it's not really this training, but if it might come up and I'll do a quick model of it. But, you know, there's four main aspects of the mind and one is called chitta and, and it's, it's your memory bank. It's where all your memories and impressions go in there. They're called samskaras or vasanas. And they go in there and they stay in there with you. It's like your cloud that comes around with you Everything you do is recorded in there. In some way or another, it's going to be affecting you. So there's that aspect of the mind. There's memory. And then there's your ego, which is the aspect of your mind that identifies with things and attaches to things and associates its, um, its self-worth and attaches that to different things and has images of what, what am I attached to? What are my likes? What are my dislikes? So that's the aspect of the mind called your aham, ahamkara or your ashmita. Okay, and then we have the uh, manas, part of your mind, which is basically the part that's linked to the senses, that's looking around, your conscious mind that's seeing and experiencing the world through the senses. And then you have what's called your buddhi, your higher mind, which is the, the part of your mind that's a bit closer. Well, there's different layers of buddhi, but it's the part of your mind that discriminates and calculates and can actually make decisions properly if it's well, if you connect with it well. So it explains all things and it explains what happens when the ego or the ashmita, the identifier, takes over. It explains how your memories affect you if you're relating them to something else that's going on and what are the emotions attached to your memories. I'll explain a little bit more about this in the Sun Kim model as well, but this is just a snippet of this, of this sutra stuff. I mean, that's just the basic outline of some of the mind stuff. Then it goes very into depth about um, the causes of suffering, the five kleshas, your likes, your dislikes, your aversions, your ignorance, um, you know, your fear of death, death, fear of loss, those sorts of things. There's all names for all those things, the kleshas, you know, avidya, ashmita. Um, so it's deep, you know, it goes deep into psychology as, as a part of it. And then it goes beyond psychology into really talking about the soul. So, you know, it's, it's that, this text is about the final destination. It's meant to take you to the final destination. This is not a beginner's book. The Yoga Sutras is not, you know, not where to put your foot. In. It doesn't even talk about asana. It just tells you to relax and be steady. And, um, you know, it doesn't break down asana at all. It just says four things about it, or really three things about it. It's more just about being steady in your body and still so you can meditate. So, you know, the mind, psychology, meditation, and soul. But there's a lot of secrets. That's why I, we have a training called The Secrets of the Sutras because there's a lot of things that need translating out of that text. Anyway, so that's, that's the sutras. Tantra, boy. There's probably not much I couldn't write in here, but Tantra is about the masterful... use of prana so while the classical yogis or the yogi yogis their medium to access enlightenment is the mind that's how they look at it they're like the way into the the way into the soul is through the mind um, and these guys don't disagree but they're just saying well if we manage prana First, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to work with the mind. In fact, if we set up our energy ideally, then we are automatically set up to see the soul. So they just have a different medium. And honestly, they're not even separate systems eventually. What, we've, you know, what, we've, what I've found to understand over, after years of studying it and hearing it that Patanjali wasn't tantric and and, and um, the Yoga Sutras are not tantric. You know, it never made sense to me to hear that. But now I understand that, that Patanjali was absolutely tantric. And in fact, he was, he was a Sri Vidya practitioner. 
He was one of the greatest sages in the lineage of Sri Vidya, which is a tantric lineage. So he just gave a specific um, set of teachings for that era and that time and one way in, you know. And understand that there's multiple ways in. These guys say the masterful management of prana. Another thing about Tantra Yoga is, is the Tantrics were the ones that, um, let me come over closer to the mic. They were the ones that figured out that you, that you can use your body as a means to enlightenment rather than have it as a, as a uh, distraction or an obstacle. They were like, hang on a second. We have all these energetic points. They saw all these points and all these channels and then they saw the chakra system. This is the great sages in the day, the great seers. They saw all this energy and meditated on it. And they were like, wow, so there's energy, there's these condensed energy centers here and then there's all these other sort of secondary mama points on the body and the joints and different parts of the body on the face and the neck, all around the feet. There's all these, there's 108 of them, main ones. And then of those 108, there's, there's uh, seven or nine, depending on the model, of these main concentrated marma points, which are your chakras, which are you know, situated along the spine. Um, and they figured out if you held energy in certain places using these techniques of locking the throat and locking at the base of the spine in your perennial floor area, uh, and then shifting your attention or doing a forward fold while you're doing that or compress that area and concentrate energy there or if you do a back bend, it'll concentrate it there. They were the ones that figured out that moving your body in certain ways, specifically your spine or putting pressure on certain points, can open up these channels and, and have a direct effect on your mind. So I guess that was a long way of saying Tantra, tantra is the source of all Hatha Yoga. Okay. And I guess I gotta do that explanation too, don't I? So Tantra is the source of Hatha Yoga. Now Hatha Yoga is not a style of yoga. This is a modern incorrect um, use of the word. You know, you go to a yoga studio and you can do vinyasa or you can do Hatha Yoga. I can't wait for the day where that's over, but I don't know. I'm not seeing it in the near future, but eventually we will name pose it. We will name practices correctly at some point. And if not, if you know it, then you're, you're going to be better off. Hatha yoga, the word hatha means forceful. You know, it's, it's also, I think this is, I think this is somewhat incorrect. It's, it's, it doesn't actually mean sun moon, although the goal of hatha yoga is to balance the energies of the polarities. But hatha, the word means forceful, and then yoga actually is a state more than anything. So it's a forceful practice to get you to this state. And this state of yoga is this clear, clear um, perception, complete clarity of mind. Okay, so hatha yoga then is the umbrella of all of the different styles that use the body as a means to, to get to this state. So if you're using postures, you're using these breath techniques and holding the breath, you're using bandhas and mudras and things like that. This is all from this tradition. It's not from Patanjali. He wasn't, we don't even know if Patanjali did Hatha Yoga practices or not. We don't really, we, we still don't know that much. But what we do know is the Hatha Yogis gave an in-depth explanation of postures and vi they were even talking about the pranavayus and all that thousands of years ago and to have them figure out what was going on energetically like that without having any of the instruments that we have now was unbelievable like it's wild so all of the poses whether you're doing them fast or slow or in a heated room or in a cold room or on props or not that's all under the umbrella of hatha yoga if it's getting you if it's leading you to the state of yoga if you're just doing exercise for the sake of exercise, it's, you can just cancel the word out of it, yoga. You can just call it hatha something, hatha asana. Okay, but if it's there to, if you're doing, using the body and these techniques, which specifically are asana, pranayama, bandhas, mudras, yantras, visualizations, meditation, kriyas, then they all fall under this category here of hatha yoga. 
So if you think of all the modern day styles, they're all, they're all Hatha Yoga. Vinyasa is Hatha Yoga. Maybe, if, you're, if it's leading you to a state that's more calm and steady in the mind, then we could call it Hatha Yoga. But just think, oh, Bikram, I, mean, I don't even like to put that one in there, but, you know, all of these, all of these modern day schools are schools of Hatha Yoga and Tantra. They're, they're borrowing from the Tantric tradition. Somewhere along the lines, it just got mixed up that people were relating the Yoga Sutras to Asana. It was just not really, just because the word was in there, you know. But anyway, it's just misunderstanding. We'll, we'll know better. So all of Hatha Yoga is all of the postures, however they're practiced, that's all part of the Hatha Yoga science. And that came from the Tantric tradition, not the classical yoga tradition. Okay. So, but I mean, Tantra and the Tantric training, as you know, those who have done it, its scope is huge. It's, uh, what's included in Tantra, now I just call everything Tantra, depending on who I'm talking to, of course. Um, but Ayurveda is included in Tantra. Vedic astrology, herbology, gemology, um, all of the yogas, Hatha yoga, um, Kriya yoga, uh, what else? You know, Yana yoga, Bhakti yoga. Tantra embraces all of the techniques. That's why it's called the most comprehensive, inclusive school. If it's a technique and a practice that is going to move you closer to your soul purposefully, then they will embrace it. That's the thing. So it's such a big school. But the main medium is prana. That's the big thing I want to say. They work mostly with managing energy to get you to that state. Okay. So my school, Rod School, Pari Yoga, this is all part of it because it all works together so perfectly we don't say this is one path or that's another path they're actually you can utilize both it depends on the individual and where you are on your journey and even what kind of constitution you are what what is going to be best suited for you maybe you'll start off with hatha yoga and you'll go deeper into the teachings of patanjali at some point but then you'll see within the teachings of patanjali is actually a lot of tantric concepts and then all of these are all looking towards Ayurveda to being their, their um, base platform of all the principles. Because you can't practice these purposefully without understanding the principles of Ayurveda. You just, really, you just can't. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's the sort of base idea of these all being one big integrated system. Yeah. So is there any, any questions on that part of it? I didn't actually read through the other. Let's see what, um, let's do a little bit of reading out of the book. So, so I'll read what Rod says about yoga now. I do it in this order. He does it in the other order. Yoga, the, the light of self-knowledge. It's one of the six systems of Indian philosophy called darshana. The word darshana means to see or to reflect. Yoga above all else is the means to see, to clearly perceive yourself and the world. That's basically what I was saying is the lens is clear and not distorted. Sankhya is the theoretical source of yoga and is another of the six darshanas, which we're going to do the Sankhya model this afternoon. Yoga is a vital thread in Pari Yoga, providing the foundation for integration, steadiness, and discernment. Yoga points the way to how we achieve life's highest aims through the power of self-knowledge. Power without awareness is dangerous and awareness without power is ineffectual. So that's, that's a, a big key that I talk about quite a lot as well. The distinct features of yoga in this thing is sthiram, stability. It refers to both physical and psychological steadiness. Sthiti, unsuppressed calmness, a calm state. Viveka means discernment or it means clear seeing also. Klesha, the afflictions, the causes of suffering. I outlaid the five of them a little while ago. And karma, action, destiny, and love. Okay. So that's what he's got in here about. You can read this stuff as well on your own. And then Tantra's worldview. We'll just do a little bit of here and then we'll move into a practice in a second. So the definition of Tantra, you know, it means to weave, means a technique, science, methodology, and another meaning is to be touched or to have your heart touched. And these are those practices that empower you to create deeper meaning and purpose and to experience a luminous view of yourself and the world. Tantra's goal is both fulfillment, which is boga, 
and accomplishment bukti, uh, yeah, bukti, and freedom moksha. So that's its goal. So it is about enjoying it being in the world, but freedom from our attachment from it, an accomplishment of, of achieving that. Power is necessary to be successful and achieve happiness, worldly and spiritual happiness. Tantra's worldview is both uh, dualistic and non-dualistic. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that when we do Sankhya. The world is beautiful and everything is divine. These are worldviews of Tantra. To see it, we must reorient it, uh, ourselves the way nature intended. Tantra is the science of energy management. There's no energy in the body that's not in the universe, and there's no energy in the universe that's not in the body. Okay. So prana dharana, I mean the concentration, collecting and stabilizing of prana or, or energy, mastering of the life force, and the core intention of, divinity, of tantra is to embody divinity and to see everything as divinity. Okay, okay. Any, any questions on that part? It's a bit of an overview of everything that we incorporate into all these trainings. You know, I've got, how many have I got now? I don't know, seven, seven five-day trainings. Rod's got, I think, nine or ten, maybe a couple more now with Yoga Nidra and so forth. Um, but everything in those trainings is some part of this and it's all it's actually all of these things integrating together but some trainings we just focus a little bit more on um, one or the other this particular training i could say specifically into the integration of of ayurveda and tantric hatha yoga not forgetting about classical yoga at all but it's mostly about the integration of ayurveda and tantric yoga and in fact, I'm not sure when the text, the, the text for this changed, and I was a bit surprised that he changed the, the, the required reading to the Desikachar book. The initial book for this training is Yoga and Ayurveda by David Frawley, which is, the, which is the required reading for my level one Ayurvedic yoga specialist training. The reason I say I like the other book maybe better for this training for is because I don't even, I don't think there's any mention of Ayurveda much at all in the, in the, the this reading, the Desika Cha, the Heart of Yoga book. So, so we're going to go over it anyway. Okay, no questions on that intro piece. Three rivers. Awesome. All right. Uh, I've got one question. Yeah, go ahead, mate. Stefano, is it? Uh, yeah. Hey, mate. Bring the, it on. this eight limbs of yoga thing, and I'm kind of just from your explanation before that, it sounds like yoga is kind of the final destination point, say, for practice. Like you kind of lead up with the tantric art stuff, and with the tantric art stuff, you have the foundational knowledge of Ayurveda, and then you end up in a yoga state of, of meditation, say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how that is to do this, the eight limbs. You haven't mentioned it yet, but that's. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. The eight limbs is outlined in the Yoga Sutras. It's towards the end of the second chapter leading into the third chapter. And it's, it's, um, it's part of Patanjali's system and they call it Raja Yoga. So the eight limbs is actually here. And it's mapped out in the sutras and that's where... Um, Let me see. So they have an eight an eight stage path. There's different paths. You know, they have an eight stage path, and it maps out from starting from where you are, moving through these eight progressive stages towards enlightenment or the state of yoga that you're, you're talking about. Now, the um, tantra and specifically the Guranda Samhita, which is one that we all practice a lot, it has a seven stage path, and it's got to do with the moon sun fire model. And if you've, um, you, we, we go over that in the, well, we go over this all in the sutras training and we go over that seven stage path in the tantra training. So they're just different paths and you'll see some differences but some similarities as well. And the basic idea, the similarities between these sort of mapped out eight rungs, which is, that means ashtanga, that's the, that's the actual traditional meaning of the word ashtanga. Uh, ashta means eight and anga means limbs. Um, 
Nothing to do with the, the vinyasa sequence that was made up by Patabi Joyce either. Um, but the, you'll see the similarities where they're both talking about this systematic process about do some preparation first. Get your body prepared. Get your attitude prepared. Then move towards stabilizing and stilling your mind and building, they don't say directly, but building your ojas as well. <laughs> so they're saying you start off here. You start off here by understanding what the faults are, where, where am I, you know, what are, my, um, what are my own obstacles? So awareness is a part of it. Then you work towards stilling the mind and stabilizing the body and the nervous system. Then at the end of it, you get into the more heightened, energetic, subtle practices of mantra. And both of these systems are similar in that respect. They might use different wording and different, slightly different techniques, but they're actually quite similar. And I do write them out side by side in the, in the tantra training. Uh, and the sutras training, just to show you the differences and similarities. So there are just different approaches getting to the same point. Why I say this one's more aligned with knowledge and understanding yourself and meditation in the mind. This one will give you more Hatha yoga techniques. And you could look at it that you, you start off with Hatha yoga and it leads you more towards this process, but it's really, it's really hard for me to separate them anymore because the heightened practices of Tantra will get you there too. It's not like you start off with Hatha Yoga and then it leads you to Patanjali Yoga. You can look at it that way actually. But you can also look at it that this sets you up for the heightened practices of Tantra. It kind of depends on, you know, it depends on which one you're emphasizing the most at the end of the, the, end of the day. So, There's a follow-up question that came to mind just now. Yep. I don't know what book it is, I'm not good with names, but one of them starts with, I meditate on the fire. Mm -hmm. And so is that kind of like the final stage there in the seven stage process of fire? Does it kind of culminate in meditation on the fire? Yeah, yeah, that, that book is the oldest book on the planet. It's the greatest text of all time, basically the oldest text of all time. It's the Rig Veda. I meditate on the fire. Om Agne Mide. Um, Basically, all of this is meditation on the fire. All of Tantra is really, if we look at all of this stuff, everything has come from the fire. Everything comes from the fire of this explosion. Everything goes back to the fire. We worship the fire. The fire is the means and the fire is the ends. So I meditate on the fire is basically just stating fire is the essence of our soul, is fire, is this, well, is light. I'll say light. Because light is the essence of fire. So that's the start of that text. And that's, you know, the Rig Veda. It's, a, it's, a, it's the oldest known text on the planet. Um, so that's the opening stage. Yeah, it's all meditation on the fire. Exactly. Cool. Does that help, Stefan? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, just, I sent a message just saying... If I ask you any questions, you can definitely tell me to shut up. Yeah, no, it's all good, man. And, I, and I, as long as I leave them to question points, it's only when it's sort of halfway through and, you know, it doesn't happen much online, which is good. But, yeah, no, bring on the questions. I think they actually help people. So bring them on, man. I don't mind. I'll shut you down if you get too much. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, great. Love it. All right. <clears throat> if there's no more for that little section, I mean, this, this is a big can of worms, really, to, to write it out in such short sort of time, it, it's tricky. There's one here. Um, bring them on, dude. There you go. Yeah, the questions are great. Bring them, bring them on. Um, it starts, you know, the, the questions are great in the sense that if your mind is going on a, somewhere into unlocking something, unlock it. Like if, you, if I can help you unlock it or we can bring it up here, go with it. I mean, that's for everyone. If you are thinking about it and like, I won't ask that question, ask it. At least write it up there so it gets answered. Because if your mind starts going down a path, you want to keep unlocking the doors while you're on that trail. Because if sometimes you'll go back and retreat and then you'll forget about it and you might have missed that learning opportunity, it'll come up again. But um, it's nice to follow threads of your mind if you're starting to understand something. So, Okay. All right, so in between these lectures and, and, um, and practices, I've got to do shuffling around here. So I'll give you like 10, 15 minutes a break. Um, and then I'll set up and we're going to do a practice. So just have your mats out. I don't know, maybe a strap and a blanket. You, you won't need much. And 
Um, and uh, if you've got a block, just have them there. It's not crucial. And, and by all means, the, the practices just, just sort of, you know, adapt the way you need to. If you need to do modifications, don't, you know, no need to push or stress yourself or hurt yourself. Don't do that. Just do it the way you can and, and really just take in the, the sequencing, take in the direction. You know, I don't practice in a way that people are going to get hurt anyway. It's all really about stability and, and, um, and focusing awareness on how, what's going on in your system. So, so we'll set up. What time is it now? So let's um, say 22. Yeah, we'll have like 15 minutes. Come back at 22 and we will have a pra- – we'll do a practice. We're going to do a um, – We're going to do a lateral practice, actually. Let me see. Tantra is the, Abby's just saying, Tantra is the science of prana. Yes, it is. I've heard it to be defined as to weave. Yes, how would you define the word? Oh, let's get that. Hang on. Do you want to, do you want to um, jump off mute, Abby, and we can chat about that? Defined as to weave. Yeah, to weave is one of the main. I'll talk about to weave if you like. Uh, yeah, cool. So, there's a, I mean, like a lot of Sanskrit words, there is, um, they have a lot of meanings and sometimes they mean similar things and sometimes the, the word might mean quite different things. But the meaning of to weave in Tantra is one of the ways of, I like it, the, explaining it the most is, um, you know, I've heard it, it's to weave all these different aspects of the traditions and all these teachings together. That is one way of looking at it. But they talking about Tantra as a system and they use weaving as a metaphor in the sense of Tantra is the system of weaving itself. So, but, so what do we need for that? Which is um, we need a machine. Okay, We need a machine, which is a, um, a loom. Is that right? I keep forgetting that word. A loom is a sh- machine that you weave on. So this this piece of technology is a machine, machinery, and then we need some kind of material to weave. Maybe it's satin or it's cotton or something like that. So we have the material, we have the the machine or the technology, and then there's an actual process that that this machine is designed to do. You know, and it's lifting up threads. You you tie all the different threads and colors on, and it lifts them up and folds them under, and it weaves, and it's doing this whole process of uh, intertwining all these different threads and different colors into specific patterns, okay, to design this beautiful tapestry or this beautiful expression of divinity and whatever it is. You know, maybe it's this beautiful colored thing or maybe it's just one color, whatever it is. It's all beauty depending on the eyes of the seer. But the, the process of weaving and that's relating it to Tantra is it's the whole process. It's the material to be woven. And in this case, in Tantra with us, it's, it's us. We're the material to be woven. So we go through this process of weaving and integrating this material through this process of turning and folding and twisting, whatever it may be, you know, in Tantra Yoga. Maybe Tantric Hatha Yoga techniques is the technology, meditation and pranayama and yantras and mantras and all that sort of stuff. And then the outcome is you as you're um, in Svasti or Svasta, the most vibrant thriving version of yourself is the woven tapestry so a fearless thriving being is the outcome so they explain tantra as the whole process it's the material it's the technology it's the um the the machinery if you like as well and then it's the process itself and then it's the outcome so that's that's how they relate it that's one way that's my favorite way of explaining the weaving the weaving part. Does that, does that make sense, Abby? Yeah, that was, that was really well said. And I like how you brought in Svasta to be established in myself. That, that was great to be the, the end product of that process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the goal is to be you, you know, because we're, and we'll go into this with the, with the Sankhya thing. We're all an individual spark of the great spark or we're all an individual fire of the great fire or we're all a drop of the great ocean and each of us has a very unique expression of divinity that's the goal of all this is just to be the most thriving primo version of your individual self what are you what's your dharma what's your dharmic expression do that to the hill and that's the goal so yeah that is that's tantra is just to be 
the most shining version of yourself. Yeah, it's um, it's one. You know, there's lots of good explanations, but that one that's that's one fits for me. I like it. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Well, let's have a break. Let's come back at quarter two now, and I'll just shuffle everything around, and uh, we'll do a practice, probably about an hour and a half ish max. We're going to med- we're going to learn meditation kriya every day, probably a couple. There's a lot of kriyas in these trainings, probably more than I'd give out, but we got we got to get through about eight this week. So. Um, so we're going to do one today. I think it's a third eye kriya we do today. It'll be a lateral emphasized practice. And then a kriya, third eye kriya at the end of it. So uh, so maybe I'll say that now. I would suggest after the training with the recordings, write down the kriyas because they're not in the books or anything. They're not in the manual. Some of them are, a lot aren't. So I would suggest writing them down after the training to get, get used to them or record them. Okay, cool. We'll see you in 15 for a practice.